Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Booty. Jeff Booty is the founder and president of JobSnap, the hiring voice of Generation Z. He has worked in the hiring market for years focused on Gen Z and millennials using video and digital mobile profile technology to shift the hiring process. He's gamified the hiring process for hourly workers and employees. Before working in the recruiting market, Jeff managed uh, Oprah's business funds with Oprah Magazine right out of college. Learning a lot about what it takes to run a business from working for Oprah pushed him to start his own company. In recruiting, he's worked with clients hiring needs for all the top brands such as L, Warner Music Group, Vera Wang, PETA, Esquire, and Oprah Magazine to name a few. He's been featured on NPR, Ebony Magazine, and Forbes in the Under 30 Summit Circle, as well as quoted on Forbes.com several times. He's an international keynote speaker. In 2014, he spoke at one of the tech industry's biggest tech conferences, the Lean Startup Conference in San Francisco, discussing mobile technology and social entrepreneurship. He teaches people how to build relationships so you're never left worrying, how do I, when you make a career move. He's open to speaking opportunities with a request in advance. He sits on the board of youinspire.org and is actively involved with she's the first.org. With respect to your presentation, some questions I have here for you, Jeff. As the global workforce becomes the local workforce, how should education keep pace? How do relationships impact creativity and innovation? And what does it look like in your environment? Hello, is this on? Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, actually, I think uh, I'm going to focus on the latter since my counterpart uh, focused on that earlier. Um, thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, this elevation's starting to affect me, so sorry for running off there. I'm like crazy. I live in Los Angeles, so this is, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm breathing more than I normally have to breathe. And I didn't think it would affect me, so I'm like, what's happening? Anyway, uh, I'm back. <laughs> um, lots going on in this last hour. Lights and everything, hail. Uh, it's fun. <laughs> it's really entertaining. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm a tech guy, and um, I'm going to really just talk about some of the things uh, that is required when it comes to creating a tech company, when it comes to creativity, when it comes to relationships. I've highlighted a few things that I'll kind of just give you examples on what's required in our, my industry. Specifically, I'm on the West Coast in L.A. We call it Silicon Beach, uh, right next to... <laughs> you know, just a 30 minute or an hour flight from Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco. And one of the biggest things that's required when it comes to technology is funding. And it was really cool to be here today uh, earlier judging to see some of these ideas uh, from some of your students who are in middle school, which I think is amazing. Uh, some of the ideas I thought were like winners, uh, but then I thought, okay, it's gonna take a lot of funding uh, for this to actually be executed. and. Right now, when it comes to relationships and creativity, in the community that I'm a part of, who you know makes a, it's a big part of who you know in order for you to get that funding. Uh, and I think that's a problem. So I'll speak about JobSnap and how I got my first round of funding. So the problem that the tech community is currently facing is realizing that if you don't know anyone and you could have the greatest idea like some of these students I saw earlier, your idea, your, the chances of it getting into market is almost impossible because right now, as my uh, panelists over here mentioned, it takes, it takes so much capital to get an idea to market. Um, and there's so many other things in between. And getting JobSnap off the ground, I usually, when I speak at high schools, I'll tell, uh, I'll ask uh, the kids in the audience, I'll say, how much do you think it costs to get a prototype out into the market? Just the simplest thing, not even a fully functioning working product that could be used by more than a thousand people. And they throw out numbers, you know, all over the place, 100,000, you know, 10,000, 5,000. And I say minimum it takes, JobSnap was quoted $150,000 just to get a working prototype. Now who has $150,000 just lying around to 
for an idea. That's, you know, we're in an education space. Um, some people do, yes, some people do. Yes, some people do. But who, should those people control the ideas? Is it, is the funding, does funding equal innovation? It shouldn't. If you have great ideas, you, just because you have the capital doesn't mean you're, you should be the one to actually create those ideas. And unfortunately, there are many people who have great ideas who could never get it to market because they don't have the funding. And I think that's a huge issue that uh, the, tech, the tech community is now facing. And you know, for us, we're coming up with ideas and grants and all types of opportunities for people who don't have funding to actually get those ideas to market. Um, there's most recently, if you guys aren't aware, being on the education side, uh, Title III just passed, which is a huge um, boost for people who aren't accredited. Uh, one of the biggest f uh, things that people face when they're trying to raise capital to get that idea into the market is that you have to be, you have to have a net worth of a million dollars or more. So not only are you having an issue of where, how do I get the 150,000? Uh, Cause you can, you know, the, essentially you could try to scrape it together with a few friends and family, but the old way was that they each, that those friends and family had to be accredited and that meant they have to be worth a million dollars or more or else you could have legal issues. And so the, 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 the Title III that just passed basically allows anyone to crowdfund uh, into your idea, which is a huge opportunity for people who just have ideas and don't have individuals that they know that are worth more than a million dollars. Uh, and so what the tech community is now doing is allowing not just the 1% to fund these innovative ideas around globally, it's now allowing people who, who, could, who again, who just have ideas to actually get it to market, which I think is phenomenal. And I think will completely shift how ideas are, how these, you know, one of the, one of the ideas I saw today was a girl who had a plate uh, and she, she created it because her, I think it was her uncle who had one hand uh, and it had suctions on it. And she wanted to um, get this manufactured uh, but didn't know, her, her mom asked me, you know, how do we get this manufactured? And immediately I said, thinking of funding, I thought, well, you need a patent lawyer. Before you even try to manufacture this, make sure Procter and & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson don't have this already in their queue uh, because <laughs> no need to spend money that, you know, that's, you don't have because it's going to cost you so much more to actually get this to market. Um, but again, like what's exciting is that this Title III will allow anyone who has <laughs> these ideas to at least push through and, and, get, it, and get it crowdfunded, um, which is pretty excited, uh, exciting to me. The next thing is, you know, when I look at this question that I'm answering, how do relationships impact creativity and innovation? When it comes to funding, it's who you know in order to get the funding. Now that's changing. It also requires you to be open-minded. I think in the education space, if you're not open-minded to take those risks, uh, I think when it comes to technology, the thing that I love about my environment is that nothing's too big. You know, you, you can always, you know, there are ideas that are being formed right now and you may not understand it, just like Twitter. People didn't understand Twitter for years and even those who are still trying to figure it out. It's the same like Snapchat. I was, you know, I'm a millennial and, you know, I focus on Gen Z and when I speak at uh, high schools, again, these students are so, like, the, the amount of the marketing opportunity for businesses to, um, to be on this platform, not to run away from it because you don't understand it. I think we're not even, we're just not even at the surface for where, for what Snapchat will be when it comes to uh, content and marketing to this new group of, of, of influencers. Uh, it's, it, it, that's, that's another huge thing about, uh, in my environment, being creative means being open-minded. It means being able to not look at an idea, and I think this happens in education. You don't, there's no dumb question. There's, at least growing up, I always was told in class, you know, there's no dumb or stupid question. Ask that question. But yet, you st people are still afraid to ask those questions because of many other, because of many things, right? Anyone, people can sit in this room, and you, some of you might be afraid of to ask that question because you're thinking, um, I'll wait till later. I don't want to ask that in a room. There are many different social studies on you know, what questions and what do people ask and who actually asks those questions. Um, but I tipped, I, I hit on it earlier, rules. 
Like rules are a huge thing that the tech community hates. You look at Uber, you look at um, uh, Airbnb. You know, what I'm doing with JobSnap is changing the rule from being traditional when it comes to the paper resume, when it comes to digital resume. I've had um, old schoolers, I'll, I'll say that word, <laughs> ask me, um, video, is video really, a, is video gonna be the next thing? And this was two years ago when we were just a, a piece of paper. And I said, I, I literally saw, not even Facebook had the video yet, and I was like, video is going to be how we communicate live, interactive, before Periscope, like literally I was like, video is it, there's no question, YouTube, was what is and st is still a beast when it comes to video content. But YouTube, and I saw this from being in recruiting and mobile, YouTube could never figure out how to create a great app. They had become um, almost in a sense so corporate because they were on the web, web and, and web is different from mobile. Uh, and I try to explain this to people, web is a completely, and some of you guys might know, if you go to your phone and you're trying to type in a website and it doesn't interact well, you get frustrated. Uh, because it's all over the place and you're trying to type in, uh, that's a totally different interface. That means that that platform didn't make it mobile friendly, uh, it, even if it's not an app. That means that when you're going on that website, it's still web. And that's an issue for that company. Um, but essentially, breaking rules. So when people ask me, is video um, going to be the next way when it comes to recruiting? I say yes, because ultimately what video does now is it takes you off of a piece of paper or digital and allows you to be in the room without b physically being in the room. And I think that in itself is going to be huge as we save time, save costs, um, employee turnover. Uh, Jobs Not focuses on high turnover industries, retail, restaurant, hotels, where it's really entry level, focused on personality. You can't see a great smile on a piece of paper. So breaking rules in my and the tech community is what we love to do because we like to think that what's the status quo can't all can't doesn't mean that it's that it, things can't change, um, and it excites me to be around other innovators because you know we're constantly pushing ourselves to um, think of ways to make life easier with technology, not run away from it. Um, and and when you have someone who is creative, um, and again going back to open minded. Who, who will run with you with that idea, who won't shun you and say, nope, there's no way I'm getting in someone else's car to take a ride uh, who I've never met or don't know. And through my phone, how's that gonna work? Um, when people can fund these ideas, I think that's what's exciting. And so that's, you know, overall, I think it helps to have one person believe in you, but you know, I th if we all know, there are many innovations and innovators who would tell you no one believed in them and they had to break through on their own. Um, and by on their own, they had to really push, um, push because they got so much pushback because no one could really understand. And so as educators, I think, you know, being in that room earlier this morning, I saw ideas that even I didn't understand. And I thought, this is awesome because I'm, no one's gonna understand everything because the gifts that we have as, as humans is that we're going, some of us are gonna be creating the next you know, Snapchat, if that's the word that's relevant, where we're not gonna understand it, but it could change how people do whatever it is that people are gonna do in the future, because uh, no one really knows. And I think that's what's exciting, is that if we try to put brackets around, which a lot of times education does, uh, you're gonna miss out on how fast technology's moving, as your slide showed. Uh, it's moving so fast. So um, what, what I leave, you know, this group with is to really, you know, be, continue to be open-minded. Having this conference, Mary, is awesome. Uh, because again, you know, the education system, when you, when you look at it from a bureaucratic standpoint, you know, there's no reason why, you know, every school shouldn't have tablets and not just have them, but use them. You know, every school should now have code academies. And, you know, for me as a, a tech guy, I think those code academies, like when I looked when, this morning, you know, at, in the room of all these ideas, I thought, okay, this is great. Now, how are we gonna make sure these kids execute on them? What's the next step look like? Because it would hate, I would hate to come from LA, come here, see these amazing ideas, and nothing gets done in a year from now, that they're still trying to figure it out, and that they don't have the right support system. So the support system can't just come from them. It has to come from you guys as the leaders to say, okay, this is how we're gonna make sure you get a patent lawyer. 
this is how we're gonna make sure we set you up with a manufacturing team. And then, because I'm a business guy, the school takes 10%. It, it shouldn't change. Again, public school systems, private school, if you look at universities, they're, they're creating these innovative think tanks and they're taking a percentage, you know, getting royalty, because students, why do we go to school? Eventually we work. Um, and for many people, in the, in the, when it comes to public or private college education, you end up paying loans back and you need a, you need a good job in order to pay that back. Uh, but if you have a great idea before, you know, while in college, I think there's no reason why um, the, school, the school or whatever the system is shouldn't, because you're incubating that, that idea, shouldn't get a percentage of that so that it comes full circle, so that I don't hear that schools don't have th books, so that I don't hear that schools don't have funding, you know, for X, Y, Z. Um, I think it's re starting to think about ways that the school system could benefit using, t using the technology that these kids are gonna create with or without the system. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that's my talk. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Really getting warmed up here. <laughs> the questions are just flowing in here, um, Jeff. Oh, God. Um, you started to kind of answer, I, I think, this one a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Um, how can we get kids the skills to market their prototype within the constraints of public education? Say that again? Um, how can we get this, the kids the skills to market their prototypes within the constraints of public education? I guess my question would be what are the constraints? Um, is that, is that person in a room? Because I can think of constraints in education, but I'm curious to know what are the constraints that would prevent someone from marketing their prototype? Um, funding? Yeah. Oh, so funding, meaning how would they get funding in order yes. to, uh, with the constraints of education? So let's say you you, this, this student, I'm just speaking on top of my head here, this student has a great idea, like some of the ideas I saw, but it requires funding, and the school doesn't have the funding, so how do they get the funding to actually mark, to market, knowing that there's constraints around handling of money and all these other things? And I think, again, it's changing those rules. We make up the rules. I mean, we've, <laughs> that's just, and that's why the tech community is so great at breaking rules, is because we realize that we're the ones who made these rules. Uh, and so if the rule currently is that, or if there is no rule, because I, I know every, sta every state is different, every level of education is different, if there's no rule around funding, which, you know, school systems raise money, whether it's cupcake or some sort, so someone's handling money at some level, maybe it's creating, creating a, again, the, the think tank, sitting down with that team to say, okay, we're going to take, every school has a, a population of people who invest in things, and it's getting those parents in that community to invest in whatever the, pro the think tank becomes. Um, and then making sure, again, the bureaucratic process, which you have to almost create, which is, you know, we get 10%. Each, each, each student's idea gets funded $10,000. Um, there's got to be a clear, you know, execution plan for this idea to get funded. But at least you, you have that system in place as like, okay, we can raise $100,000. You can do a lot with $10,000, <laughs> especially a prototype, um, especially if these kids are coding. You know, the reason why technology is so expensive is because you have to outsource. Uh, you can have a great idea, but if you can't code, which is what someone else said, if you can code, code now. Like that's the, <laughs> I say that to students too. It's like you, you literally are worth a million dollars if you can code yourself. Uh, it may take you a while because you're bootstrapping, but uh, at least you can get the product built and then get it to market yourself. But the, the major cost of, of any prototype is really, if, is, if it's technology, again, I don't know if it's a, a tangible product or not, but if it's tech, then if that person can code, $10,000 can get you really far. So you don't have to think you need millions uh, to get it to market. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, it was. And you actually addressed uh, many of the other questions. And, and perfect segue over to Carrie um, as, uh, to talk about 